right, so page 398, section 65, we are looking at average value of a function. Average value of a function. All right, it's pretty easy to calculate the average value of something if you have a finite number of entries. Like, you know, we're sitting here talking about class averages. If you were trying to figure out your test average, you only have four tests. That's a finite number of things, so it's easy to just add them up and divide by the number of things. So a typical average is found just by going through and adding up the items that you have and dividing by however many of them there are. But what if it was an infinite number of things? Like the example that they give us here in the textbook, it says, um, how do we compute the average temperature during a day because there are infinitely many temperature readings that are possible? You could go through and you could take the temperature every minute or every second, or every half second, or every quarter second, or every eighth of a second. I mean, you can always take the last two time intervals that you had and go in between them in some way so that you would have an infinite number of readings. So they said figure one shows the graph of a temperature function, uh, capital T of lowercase t, where lowercase t is measured in hours, because that's your time, and capital T is measured in degrees Celsius, because that's your temperature. And then they also go through and they just guess what the average temperature might be. So basically they graph it and they go through and just draw a red horizontal line there like you see on 398, kind of running through the center of that graph. And they say that'd be about the average of the temperature of that day. Right? That's a kind of intuitive understanding of it. Let's look at an algebraic explanation of it. All right? If we've got our function y equals f of x and we are working on a time interval in between a and b, we could go through and we could compute the change in x as we've been doing since the beginning of chapter 5 by saying b minus a divided by n. In this formula, I need to know what n is equal to. So I could take change in x equals b minus a over n and solve it for n. So if I solve that for n, I'm going to cross multiply. So I'll have change in x times n equals b minus a. Divide both sides of that by the change in x, and I'll get n is equal to b minus a over the change in x. So I can go back and rewrite my average formula and say, okay, if I wanted to find the average of something, I'm just going to take each of the y values, and of course f of x is y. I'm going to take each of my y values and add them up down to the last one. And I'm going to divide that by n, and we just redefined n as b minus a over the change in x. You'll also notice the little asterisks up here that mean we could be choosing left endpoints, right endpoints, midpoints, whatever value that we wanted to out of each of those subintervals. So dividing by b minus a over the change in x is the same thing as multiplying by the change in x over b minus a. So you can see we've distributed the change in x through here. And then we've got the 1 over b minus a out in front. Now this should start looking remarkably familiar, right? Because I could rewrite this as a summation where I start at 1 and go to n of f of x sub i times the change in x. And remember that that is our definition of a definite integral. So that's what gives us the formula that you see on the bottom of page 398 for the average value of a function. If you want to find the average value of a function over an interval from A to B, even if it has an infinite number of subintervals of, of readings, like temperature readings or something like that, we could still find that average by doing 1 over B minus A, integration of F of X from A to B. All right, so look at example 1. Example 1 says, find the average value of the function F of X is equal to 1 plus X squared on the interval from negative 1 to 2. So literally all we have to do is plug in a and b. So we can go through and say okay average value is 1 over b minus a. So 1 over b minus a integration from a to b. So okay integration from a to b of my function. Now last week when we were working on volumes of revolving solids we were only setting these up. We were not going through and integrating them. I just had you set them up only because the setup was so elaborate. We are going back now to doing just our regular integration. So we do want to integrate. So what's our integration of 1 plus x squared? X plus x cubed over x. Yes. X plus 1 third x cubed or x cubed over 3. Exactly. 
We still have our um, 1 over 2 minus a negative 1, so that would be 1 over 3 out in front. And remember that notation that we've been using where we haven't plugged A and B in yet. Also, just um, be sure that you've got parentheses around the whole thing that you're plugging A and B into. Otherwise, it looks like just that last piece that we're plugging into. All right, so if we go through and we plug 2 in, then that's going to give us 2 plus 8 thirds, so that would be 14 thirds. And then we plug in negative 1, so that would give us negative 1 and a negative 1 third, so that would be negative 4 thirds. Minus a negative is going to give us plus, so that would give us 18 thirds times 1 third out in front, so that would give us 18 ninths or 2. Okay, so I understand how to use the formula, but what did I just find? Well, here's what I just found. If I graphed y is equal to 1 plus x squared in between negative 1 and 2, here's what that graph would look like, all right? That's the parabola x squared that's had a vertical shift of positive 1, right? But I'm only keeping the piece of it from negative 1 to positive 2. So this is what the graph of that function would look like. We just said that the average value was 2. So if I come in here and I draw y is equal to 2, that of course is a horizontal line at 2. It looks legitimately like if I went through and I picked a point right here and 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 I added them all up and divided by the number of pieces, it looks legitimately like I could come up with a y value of 2. It looks like the average of the y values of that function would average out to be about 2. So that's what I found. Now, over on page 399, it says, okay, so then the question arises, is there a number C at which the value of a function is exactly equal to the average value of the function? That is, is f of C equal to f average? Now, that makes sense. If we say that the average, value, the average temperature for today is going to be 68 degrees, at some point today, it's going to be 68, right? I mean, probably when we're, we're dropping uh, or when we're going up from the low of this morning to the high of this afternoon, we'll probably cross through it. And when we're going back from the high back down to the low, we'll probably cross through it. So you might even hit it more than once in a particular setting. So the mean value theorem on page 399 just says, if f is a continuous function on the closed interval from a to b, then there exists a number c in that interval where the average value is equal to f of c. So our mean value theorem for integrals is written this way in the book. I think it might be easier to see the way that we've got it written down here, where we're saying, OK, here's that formula we just found for average value of a function. And here's f of c, where, again, we're talking about um, finding a place where our average value would be equal to um, our y value. If I go through then and instead of having 1 over b minus a out in front of this thing, if I were to multiply both sides by b minus a, that creates this formula right here and that's the one that you see in the book. So it doesn't really matter which one you use, but I just wanted you to see where that one in the textbook is coming from. Again, we're just taking average value that we just created and setting it equal to f of c. The reason that I, I kind of prefer the second formula right here is a lot of times on the problems, for the A part, it'll say find the average value like we just did and got 2. And then for the B part, it'll say, okay, now find out where that's equal to f of c. So if I write it this way, I can replace this whole left-hand side with the answer that I just found and then set it equal to my function. Okay, so here's the average value of the function that we just found in example number 1. It was 2. And I want to set that equal to f of c. And of course, f of c just means your function with c plugged in in the place of x. So our function was 1 plus x squared, so I've put c in the place of x. So 1 plus c squared. All right, so how are we going to solve this guy? Subtract 1, Subtract from, one from both sides. And then the take the square root of both sides. Don't forget plus or minus. Exactly. So what we've just found algebraically is that it should be when x equals negative 1, and when x is equal to positive 1, that my average value and my function are intersecting each other, and they are. Now, something to caution you about. If this interval had been from 0 to 2, 
When I solved right here, I still would have got positive 1 and negative 1, but when I looked in the back of the book, it would have only said positive 1. And that's just because the second value wouldn't have been in my interval. So if you solve and you get, you know, two or three answers and you look in the back of the book and it doesn't have all the answers you have, double check your interval and just make sure that maybe the extra answers that you're getting are not in the interval that is designated for the problem. All right, look at example three. Top of page 400, example number three. They tell us, um, show that the average velocity of a car over a time interval from T1 to T2 is the same as the average of its velocities during the trip. And they um, uh, give us the solution there on 400 as well. All right, when we're talking about velocity, you can kind of go back to the idea of distance equals rate times time. If I'm trying to figure out what the rate is, I'm going to divide both sides by the time. So my rate is just going to be my distance divided by my time. In the terminology that we've been using, we would say that velocity is equal to our displacement divided by our time. It's just our, um, our stopping point minus our starting point over our stopping time minus our starting time. It's literally just slope formula, right? Chain y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? So that would be the average of our um, velocities. They want us to show that that's equal to the average velocity, that formula that we um, just got today. So we could go through and say, okay, here's the formula that we got today, 1 over b minus a, integration of the velocity from a to b. So let's go back and plug in what we know is a and what we know is b. So we can go through and say b is time 2, a is time 1, b is time 2, a is time 1. Velocity is the same thing as the derivative of the position function. So I'm going to replace velocity with the derivative of position. And of course, when I integrate a derivative, they undo each other. And when it's a definite integral, I'm going to plug in those values. And so I'm going to come down here and say, according to the total change theorem, s of t sub 2 minus s of t sub 1 we still have that, that 1 over t2 minus t1 out in front as well. So if I multiply, I'll end up with s of t sub 2 minus s of t sub 1 divided by t sub 2 minus t sub 1, and that is the exact same thing that we had gotten up here. So we've proven that the average velocity is the same as the average of the velocities, which is logical, that makes sense to us, but we've algebraically proved it as well. All right. So for our homework tonight on page 400, we're doing 5, 7, 9, 11, 17, omit C, FRQ number 3, challenge 15.